Okay, good morning, welcome everyone. As a coastal ecologist, um, I'm really interested in those processes that maintain and um, change both biodiversity. Um, so these processes might be natural processes and they might be human processes as well. And so what I wanted to talk to you today about is the unprecedented challenges that um, humans are throwing at um, our biodiversity and the important services that it provides. And I guess um, how this is increasingly making it a fairly interesting job to be an ecologist, to nut out what will happen to um, our species and the important services they provide. Um, so in terms of what humans are doing to the environment, um, we are creating changes in our natural world at unprecedented rates. And so first of all, we're introducing pollutants to the environment. And so you can see here um, an example of all the plastics that are washing into our oceans off the land. Um, here we've got um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that you might remember um, a year or so back um, and the massive oil plume it created in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we're also seeing unprecedented rates of change in habitats. So uh, deforestation and land clearing is a prime example of this. And um, what we're increasingly doing is replacing uh, natural habitat with um, our own cities and um, urban structures. Um, as well, um, through our harvest of organisms, we're increasingly changing food web structure as well. And so this diagram here um, is basically what sh shows what happen, happens over decades of over harvest of fish. And so what happens initially is um, when we first commence harvesting fish, um, we're targeting those largest fish, those meatiest, tastiest fish. Um, and as we successively remove the largest fish from the food web, um, we then focus our attention on the next largest fish, and then we fish those down. Then we move to the next largest fish um, until, um, you know, I guess what eventually we do is end up with only small fish left in the ocean. So this is another example of the types of modification that the humans are having. And um, undoubtedly, the largest change um, we as humans are making to the environment is um, anthropogenically induced climate change. Um, so by increasing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, um, we are causing um, warming of our planet. Um, and with warming of the planet also changes um, in other aspects of climate, such as patterns of rainfall and patterns of drought. And I'm not going to go into this slide in detail, but this was something that was produced by the Bureau of Meteorology this past summer, basically showing all the records that were broken over this past summer in Australia. Um, so things like the hottest day on record, the warmest, um, prolonged warmest period, um, those kinds of things, um, I guess high rates of fire. Um, and that this is just isn't a one-off event. So they also produced one of these for 2012, 2013. And there were records broken in that year as well. So basically every year we're seeing more and more records broken in terms of um, climate. And so um, scientists, um, I guess, you know, very aware of this fact that humans are more and more um, modifying the world that we live in and having a major footprint on the earth, um, have unofficially started terming um, this age of man as the Anthropocene. So anthropo is just a Greek word that means human. Um, and so at the moment, um, this is just an unofficial term, um, but there are actually moves afoot to actually register this, register this as an official geological epoch um, because of the major effects man is having. Um, so this is actually a pretty interesting time to be working as an ecologist, because um, as an ecologist, what we're interested in is how um, organisms and the ecosystem services that they sp support are going to respond to this environmental change. So what we're not only interested in is biodiversity, but all the important things biodiversity does as well. So obviously biodiversity um, supports things like fisheries um, and forestry, um, so products that we like to harvest. Um, biodiversity um, helps to maintain clean air, um, clean water, that kind of thing. Um, it's of recreational and aesthetic value. Um, in the coastal environment, things like mangrove forests can prevent, uh, provide storm protection and prevent erosion of land. So I guess we're not just talking about species for species sake, but also all the important things that species do.
And so in terms of environmental change, there's a number of ways that organisms might respond. Um, so they might be able to tolerate the environmental change. It might um, be within the um, window of conditions um, that they are able to cope with. And so things might be just fine. Um, they may be capable of adapting to the change conditions. So this might be um, through behavioural changes. So perhaps avoiding the heat of day um, if we're talking about warming. Um, or it could be um, genetic adaptation. So um, particularly for those organisms that have very short life histories, there might be some um, capacity for um, selection and genetic change. Um, or if they're not able to tolerate conditions or adapt to the new conditions, then I guess the other alternative is extinction. And so as ecologists, we're really concerned with um, which of these things is going to happen for particular organisms. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you primarily today about is um, acidification of the oceans. Um, and so this is the, one of the major effects of um, enhanced uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, on uh, ocean environments. And so what happens, um, as you're all aware, what we're seeing is um, increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And when we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what this means is that we also end up having more dissolved carbon dioxide in the water as well. And what happens in the water is that carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. And um, what will happen is this carbon, um, carbonic acid um, will actually um, split off into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions and eventually carbonate ions. Um, so you might remember that pH, which is um, a measure of um, how acidic or how alkaline an environment is, is all to do with the concentration of these H plus hydrogen ions. And so what we see is as the concentration of these hydrogen ions in the environment increases, we get a more and more acidic ocean. So the pH is dropping. Okay, and so you might imagine that there could be fairly serious consequences of a more acidic ocean for organisms. Um, so if these organisms have um, a calcifying external structure, so perhaps the shells of mollusks or the spines of sea urchins, um, that kind of thing, that might dissolve under more acidic conditions. Um, the other thing that's happening is that there are more of these carbonate ions. And these carbonate ions tend to suck up all the excess calcium in the ocean, um, which means that there's not enough calcium available for calcifying organisms. So corals um, are impacted in terms of their growth as well. Um, and so according to the IPCC, um, pH is projected to de decrease in the ocean by about 0.355 units by 2100. Now this doesn't sound like very much, but you've got to remember that pH is a log scale, okay? It's not a linear scale. And so this means that there is going to be about 127% more of these H plus ions in 2100, okay? So this is a much, much more acidic ocean than we're seeing now. Um, and so one of the challenges for ecologists is to work out how organisms are going to respond and if, if there's anything we can do as humans um, to give the organisms their best chance against this change. Um, and so this picture here um, is just a depiction of what people think might happen. And so one of the organisms that we think might be most affected by ocean acidification um, is actually coral reef. Um, so corals are calcifying organisms. Um, they're dependent on forming a calcifying structure. Um, what ocean acidification is predicted to do is both dissolve this structure in the acidic conditions and reduce the availability of um, calcium carbonate for these organisms to actually build their skeleton. Um, but not all organisms are expected to be negatively affected by ocean acidification. So you might remember that one of the key um, requirements for photosynthesis is actually carbon dioxide. And so if we have more carbon dioxide in the water, marine plants might actually um, start to photosynthesize at a, diff at a faster rate and their populations might experience greater growth rates. So what we might predict is oceans with less coral and more algae. And so this little um, picture here, so this is sort of, this side of the slide is representative 
of, um, you know, I guess past conditions. This is um, conditions into the future with a more acidic ocean. Um, and so what we're expecting um, is um, that we might see more phytoplankton. So this is just a blow up of the um, tiny, um, uh, tiny, tiny microscopic primary producers in the ocean um, that form, um, you know, algal blooms, phytoplankton. Um, so we might see oceans that are increasingly dominated by these. Okay, so this is what we are expecting, um, but I guess there are always twists and turns in ecological stories. And so one way to get a better indication of what's going on is to actually do experiments. Um, and what we can do is experiments where we set up tanks with um, concentrations of carbon dioxide that are representative of past climate scenarios, concentrations of carbon dioxide that are representative of the present day. And we can also set up tanks that have carbon dioxide concentrations that might represent future scenarios as modelled by climate scientists. And what we can do is um, basically in these tanks um, place organisms of interest um, we could measure changes in their growth rate or their rate of calcification or their survival and see how changes in carbon dioxide may influence um, some of these key biological processes. Okay, so this is well and good, but can you see a problem with doing this kind of experiment? I'll let you think about that for a minute. Okay, so this has been the traditional approach of marine ecologists, but there is a problem with doing experiments such as this. So the first is that it's very, very small scale, isn't it? So, you know, the ocean is not a fish tank, okay? Um, and so some processes are scale dependent, okay? So that's the first process, the first problem. The second problem is that the way these experiments have typically been done in the past is taking organisms um, that are living at present day carbon dioxide concentrations um, and placing them in these um, tanks um, where the concentration of carbon dioxide and hence the acidity might be very, very different to present day. Okay, so we're actually exposing these organisms to a very, very rapid change in the environment. With climate change, this change in the environment is going to be much, much more gradual. Okay, so we don't know if organisms will exhibit the same response in terms of rates of mortality and decreased rates of growth um, and so forth, um, where the change is more gradual. Um, the other thing that this type of experiment doesn't do is allow for, um, I guess, adaptation over multiple generations. Um, so learned behaviour of organisms if they're mobile or alternatively, um, I guess, genetic adaptation by selection across mo multiple generations. Um, so these experiments are a good starting point, um, but I guess we need other tools as well as ecologists. Um, and so one thing that we can do is look at how organisms have already responded to other forms of acidification. So in our natural world, um, there are places on the seafloor where there are natural carbon dioxide seeps, where carbon dioxide um, is naturally being released from the Earth's crust. And so what we can do is um, compare the ecological communities near these carbon dioxide seeps versus further away and look at how their structure and function differs. So that's one thing that we can do. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is something that's actually going on a lot along the coastline of New South Wales, and that's um, acid sulphate um, soils and the runoff of um, acid into our waterways. Um, and so what we're seeing is actually there are a whole heap of ecological communities in our estuaries that have been exposed to acidic conditions over many, many generations. And so this might tell us something about the capacity of organisms to be able to respond to enhanced um, acidity in the future um, and whether they're going to persist um, over multiple generations. So I must caveat this by saying that the method by which um, acid sulphate soils acidify the environment is very different to um, the method by which um, carbon dioxide acidifies oceans, but the thing in common is the reduced pH. And so I guess in using this system, what I'm really interested in is low pH and what low pH does to the environment. Acid sulphate soils does not simultaneously um, increase the carbon dioxide concentration in water. So that is one difference between the two. Okay, so this is um, 
So, so acid sulfate soils um, occur in waterlogged areas, okay? So this would have been a fairly swampy area. Um, and these um, soils are naturally very rich in iron. And what has happened is that, um, I guess over decades, uh, we have drained this land for farming. So we've built these drainage channels and um, I guess drain, drain this land so it's consistently much drier and we can graze cattle and that kind of thing on it. Um, and so what this has done is actually expose the iron sulfide that is naturally in these soils to the air, okay? So naturally the iron sulfide in these soils would be in the boggy waterlogged sediment and it wouldn't be exposed to the atmosphere. But when we drain the land, this iron sulfide is exposed to oxygen. And what happens is that we get this chemical reaction where we form sulfuric acid, okay? So this is where the acid comes in and also um, solid iron hydroxide, okay? So by producing this acid, um, we are getting reduced pH conditions. And what happens when it rains is that um, this acid from the soil is washed down to our waterways and decreases the pH. And whereas I said that ocean acidification is projected to decrease pH by 0.355, in some instances we see that acid sulfate acidification can decrease pH D, sorry, pH by maybe two or three. Okay, so this is much, much more acidic. So this is a really good test of whether organisms can actually survive in more acidic conditions. Um, so acid sulfate soils are actually a really common problem in New South Wales. So this is um, the coastline of New South Wales and all these um, sort of orangey and reddy colours are areas um, where there are acid soils. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk you through, I guess, the steps I use to actually um, test some ideas about effects of this acid sulfate runoff on um, communities living in estuarine environments. And so what I want to do is basically base my um, work around these steps for ecology. So this is what I always use when I'm doing ecology. So first of all, obviously, you've got to start with a question. If you don't have a question, then, um, you know, it's pretty hard to do science. Um, once you have a question, what you need to do is turn that into a testable hypothesis. So this is something that you might be able to falsify. Um, then you need to design an experiment that is able to test your hypothesis. Um, you go and collect the data um, as part of your experiment. You analyse the data and see whether your hypothesis is supported or rejected. And then you report your conclusion. So I'm going to talk you through each of these steps this morning. Okay, so the questions that I wanted to ask were, does acid sulfate runoff reduce the density of calcifying marine invertebrates? such as oysters and gastropods. So this is a gastropod. A gastropod is basically just a snail. Um, this is an oyster. And so you can see each of these have an exoskeleton um, that is um, calcified, okay? So what we might expect is that these are the types of organisms that are particularly susceptible to the effects of low pH, okay? They might start to dissolve. Um, once they start to dissolve, they might get lesions in their shells and this might end up killing these organisms. Okay, so we're expecting reduced densities of them in um, acidified locations. And we, what we might also expect is that the acid actually um, weakens their shell by dissolving their shell. And if they have a weaker shell, they might actually be more susceptible to predation. And so these um, types of organism, um, oysters and gastropods, um, are actually really exposed to predators. They sit on the surface of the sediment or on the surface of the rock. They're in full sight of predators. And the main thing that they rely on in order to reduce predation is this exoskeleton, this hard shell that makes it difficult for predators to crunch through. So you can imagine that if this is dissolved, they're losing this line of defense and they might be more vulnerable to predation. Okay, so that's what I'm interested in testing. Um, so the way I did this was actually through spatial sampling. So um, you might remember the slide that I showed a little bit beforehand and I was talking about how there are these sort of drainage canals um, between um, the land that has been drained for farming and that when it rains these um, are where the acidified water is being discharged into estuaries. So what we might expect is that close to these drains it's going to be much more acidic 
And further from these drains, it's going to be not so acidic. It's going to be more sort of normal estuarine conditions. Okay, and so what we might expect is that close to these drains, where it's more acidic, there are going to be lower densities of oysters and gastropods than at sites further from the drains. And we might expect that um, close to the drains in the acidic water, um, the mollusks are going to have weaker shells um, than further from the drains. And as a consequence of the mollusks close to the drains having weaker shells, um, they might be more susceptible pr to predation than mollusks from sites further away. Okay, so these are our hypotheses. These are things that we can go and collect samples and test. Okay, so the next step I mentioned um, before is the experimental design. And so basically what we need to do is design how we're going to sample. So the first thing is that we obviously need to find estuaries in which acid sulfate acidification is known to be a problem, where there has been, um, I guess, where there are acid sulfate soils and where there has been the, clear, the draining of the land for agriculture. Okay, and so two of these estuaries um, where there are acid sulfate soils and runoff um, through the drains um, in New South Wales are Hunter, the Hunter Estuary uh, near Newcastle and Port Stephens slightly further north. And so in each of these estuaries, um, what we can do is find places close to drains, which as I said before, tend to be more acidified. So they have a pH um, that averages 6.6 .6 to 6.8. Um, and places further from drains. Um, so these are our reference sites, okay, the non-acidic conditions, and these have pHs that are 7.7 .7 to 7.9. Okay, so these are less acidic, okay, more alkaline. And as I said before, pH is a logarithmic scale, so this is actually a pretty big difference in um, acidification. Okay, but what we don't want to just do is sample one place close to drains and one place away from drains in each estuary because there might be all kinds of other things that differ between these locations besides, um, I guess, pH. Um, one might be in an area where the currents naturally deposit lots of larvae of animals and so there's lots of animals. One might be in a place where currents naturally don't. Okay, so what we would be more, we might be more confident in saying that there's a difference between places close to drains and far from drains if we actually sample at multiple drains and multiple places far from the drains and we find a consistent difference between these. And so what we actually ended up doing is identifying multiple sites that were close to drains and multiple sites that were far from drains. And if in each estuary, the two sites close to drains display a consistent pattern that is different or a different abundance of um, these mollusks to the places that are further away, um, then we would be more confident in saying that, okay, it might be acidification that is causing this. So this was our basic sampling design. Um, and at each site, what we measured were the density of oysters and gastropods, so these snails, and also the shell strength of these animals. Okay, so this is the basic design of our study, but the first question is how do we quantify density? So if we think about a site, you know, a site might be quite a large area. It might be an area maybe 100 by 100 metres. Although I really like my job and I really like doing ecology, I don't really want to count every single oyster and every single gastropod at these sites because I would actually be here for days on end. And so what we need to do is actually subsample. We can't count all the mollusks at a site, so we need a way to only count some of them, but in a representative way. And so one way that we can do this is using something called a quadrat. So a quadrat is just, um, I guess, a unit of fixed area. So this particular one you can see here is 0.5 metres by 0.5 metres. So in other words, it encloses an area of 0.25 metres squared. And so what we can do is just count the organisms that we find within this area. And this makes it a much more manageable thing to do. But obviously, we don't just want to do this in one quadrat because just by chance, we might actually be sampling in a place where there is a really high density of um, gastropods, a really high density of oysters. Um, what we want to do is actually do this in multiple places so we get a representative sample of our site. And so we're able to calculate a mean and some variation about the mean. And so in this case, we sampled um, 15 times in this quadrat. So we put this quadrat in 15 different places and counted the number of uh, mollusks um, each time. 
But there's another important thing here. So I said before that my hypothesis was that there would be less mollusks close to the drains where it's acidic than further away. And it would be really, really tempting if I wanted a really neat story to deliberately, or maybe not so deliberately, place my quadrat close to the drains in places where there are not so many mollusks. And um, far from the drains, um, maybe deliberately place my quadrat in areas where there are naturally more of these mollusks. So what we want to do is avoid this kind of bias where we're um, either deliberately or inadvertently um, placing our quadrats in certain positions. So there are a couple of ways to get around this. We can either do random sampling. So what we can do is use something like Excel to generate random numbers, um, which become coordinates for where we're going to sample. So Excel might give us the random numbers 12 and 5. And so that might tell us that we're going to sample 12 metres along the shore and 5 metres in. And this is where we place our quadrat. And by using randomly generated numbers, we're not actually biasing where we do our counting. Or the other thing we could do is regular sampling. So we could say, all right, I'm going to place this quadrat down every 50 metres. OK, and so this is a predefined distance apart. And this means that I can't bias my sampling by picking and choosing where I put this quadrat down. OK, so analysing the data, what did we find? So I'll just talk you through this graph first so you can see how it's orientated. So what we have on the x-axis is the two estuaries. So there's the Hunter estuary and the Port Stephens estuary. Um, and we have got the two sites that we sampled at that were close to the drains. So these are the more acidic places and the two sites that we sampled further from the drains. So these are the less acidic places and the same for Port Stephens. And what we have on the y-axis is the density of this particular gastropod, um, Bambisium auratum, per metre squared, okay? And so what I have done is calculated the average of the 15 quadrats, okay? So I added up the 15 quadrats and divided by 15 to get an average value. And the really important thing is that I've not only included an average, but I have indicated how much variability there is among quadrats. OK, and so what you can clearly see is if we look at the Hunter estuary, you can see that at each of the places close to the drain, there are fewer of this gastropod than the places further from the drain. And we get the same pattern for Port Stephens. You'll notice that there is a difference in the baseline number of gastropods between the two estuaries. So Port Stephens, for whatever um, reason, has higher densities of this gastropod. But the thing that we're really interested in is this relative difference, that in each of the places where we are close to a drain, um, where there is acidic water, um, we are seeing almost a halving in the number of these mollusks. Okay, so this is telling us that pH is having an effect. The other thing that's really um, important to note here is the height of these error bars. You can see that these error bars aren't um, massive here. Um, and so we are fairly confident that there is a distinct difference between these and these. If we had an error bar that, for example, for this one, went all the way up to somewhere here, that would be suggesting that these data are so variable that this value would be in the realms of um, the range of values we're getting. And so we would be less confident in saying that there is a difference between close to drains and further from the drains. But this obviously isn't the case here. Um, so the next thing is um, measuring the shell strength of the um, animals. So we were saying that we were expecting that in the acidified waters, the animals um, would, we suspect, have um, weaker shells. And so we can do this with an instrument called an instron. So um, this is designed by engineers for strength testing. And basically what it has is um, a needle. You put your shell under the needle, the needle comes down. And what it does is measure the force um, at which that shell starts to crack, okay? And so we can get measures of the force required to actually crack a shell. Um, so again, what we need in this instance is um, a subsample of animals for strength testing. Obviously, we don't want to test every single animal at a site because we'd wipe out the population and we'd be here for the next 50 years measuring animals. So we need to subsample um, just as we did with the quadrat. So we need some system of perhaps randomly selecting animals um, that we're going to take back and measure. 
Um, animals are naturally very variable in their shell strength, so we need lots of replicates. We don't just want to do this on a couple of animals, we need to do it on lots and lots. Um, I've told you about that already. And the other thing that we need to be aware of is that shell strength is actually a function of the size of organisms. So you might imagine that small shells have much thinner shells and weaker mm -hmm. shells than large shells. Okay, so we need to test a range of large, medium and small animals. Okay, so this slide is what we found. Uh, so this is the Hunter Estuary and this is Port Stevens. On the y-axis is the force required to crack the shells. On the um, x-axis is shell height. So this is um, how tall the gastropod is. Um, and so what this is showing is the reference sites are the black points and the acidified sites are the white points. So the first thing that you can clearly notice is in, in each place is that obviously as the shells get larger, their shells get stronger. Okay, so this is, you know, what we were expecting, which is why it's important to um, actually measure a range of animals right from the um, small to the large. Okay, but what you can notice over and above this natural variation between small and large animals is that in each case the black dots are primarily above the white dots. Okay, and so in other words the reference sites um, for any given size are requiring more force to crack um, than the animals from the acidified sites and the same here. Okay, so this is actually supporting our hypothesis um, that the animals um, have weaker shells close to the drains in the acidified sites. And we can do regressions and we can look at the slopes of these lines and you might remember that the equation of a straight line is y equals mx plus b where m is the gradient and so you can see that the slope of this dotted line which is the line of best fit for the acidified is um, less steep than for the reference Okay, so in other words, as the animals get larger, their shells are getting um, thicker at a slower rate um, at the acidified sites than the reference sites. And the same is the case at Port Stephens. Okay, but the easiest thing to do is look at where the dots are and see that all the black dots are primarily above the white dots. Okay, so stronger shells at the reference sites. Okay, so we've seen that there are fewer um, mollusks at acidified sites and that these have weaker shells. So the final thing that we wanted to do was see what this means for predation. And so this um, critter here is called the mulberry whelk and it is actually a predator of things like oysters and gastropods. And what it does is it has a separate, a special organ where it actually secretes acid. Um, and um, it bores acid through the shell of this um, and makes a little hole that's quite distinctive to see um, and then it'll suck up the tissue and consume the tissue and so obviously if this shell is thinner it's going to take this less time to actually get through. And so what we do is choice experiments where we offer a predator such as this um, some animals from acidified sites and some animals from reference sites simultaneously and over a period of a week we see how many of each type of animal it consumes. And what we do is we replace animals as they're eaten. So if an acidified animal is eaten, we replace that with another acidified animal. So we, um, through time, consistently have three reference and three acidified. Um, and over the week, we record how many of each type are consumed. Um, and we repeat this experiment um, in different tanks using um, multiple predators. So what did we find? Um, so um, this is the number of shells, um, snails consumed by a predator per trial. We found that more animals from the acidified sites were consumed than from the reference sites. Okay, so this is consistent with our hypothesis that those animals from the acidified sites have weaker shells and are more um, easy to get into than those, uh, sorry, thinner shells and easier to get into than those from the reference sites that have thicker shells. Okay, so what have we found all up? So as hypothesised, we found that there were fewer mollusks at sites closer to the drains, um, where it's acidified than further away. The mollusks closer to the drains um, were thinner shelled, as we might expect um, as a result of dissolution by the acid. Um, and the weaker shelled mollusks were consumed at a greater rate by predators.
But this isn't actually all bad news because what we found is that the pH of the water close to drains was much, much lower than is predicted for ocean acidification, even by 2100, okay? So this is a much more severe condition that's already occurring in some New South Wales estuaries than what we're predicting under climate change. And what we found is that although, yes, it weakened shells and it made um, smaller densities of um, oysters and um, gastropods at these sites with the acidified waters, these animals still survived, okay? They weren't completely wiped out, okay? Even though the water was incredibly acidified, okay? So this is interesting in telling us that although there is an impact of acidification, um, there is likely some adaptation. So animals are still able to persist across multiple generations, um, despite the fact um, that acidification can um, weaken shells and um, might um, compromise the larval stages in these animals' life history. Okay, so that is all I've got for you today. Um, so if you have any questions for me, please turn on your microphone and I'd be happy to answer them. we would expect is that these multiple changes that are simultaneously occurring would actually interact to produce in some instances non-additive effects. Um, and so many of the experiments um, that are being done in Aquaria are actually not only manipulating carbon dioxide but actually also simultaneously manipulating temperature. So um, for a high carbon dioxide treatment there might also be tanks that have high temperature and low temperature. And for some organisms we see, yes, temperature matters as well. For other organisms we see um, it is only temperature or it is only carbon dioxide that matters. So it depends a lot on the biology of the organism, which is the more important or whether both of these things are acting together. As I said before, I guess um, acid sulfate acidification not only decreases pH, but it actually adds iron to the system as well. So iron could also be impacting these organisms. Um, but I guess the types of effects that we were looking at are ones that are more consistent with effects of pH than effects of iron. And so yes, you do tend to see higher mm. concentrations of iron um, near these drains as well. Um, if you go and visit mangrove forests near these drains, um, there's often this orangey kind of tinge um, around the trees and in the water and that's, that's a sign of the high concentrations of iron. So that might also contribute as well. But we have no reason to expect that increased concentrations of iron would dissolve shells. So in that case, you know, I think it is really an effective pH. Alrighty, well thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you.